Hello, and welcome to today's webcast, System-Wide Pressure Monitoring with Low-Resolution Data, brought to you by Waterworld and sponsored by Census. My name is Alana Maya. I'm the editor for Waterworld, and I will be your moderator today. I just have a few housekeeping items before we begin. The audio, video, and slides for today's presentation will be pushed to your screen automatically. If you're running pop-up blocking software, we recommend that you disable it to view this webcast, and we also recommend that you close down any other applications for a better performance. For technical difficulties, please submit your issue through the Ask a Question box, and a member of our webcast support team will work with you to correct the problem. And the Ask a Question box is also how you can submit questions for our presenters today, and we'll take those questions during the Q&A portion at the end of our program. Uh, a certificate of attendance will be issued automatically via email within 24 hours to all of you listening today. And for your convenience, this presentation will be available and on demand within 24 hours of this live event. A reminder email message with a link to the archive will also be sent to all registrants. Um, and it, the webcast will also be accessible for six months at waterworld.com. Uh, one final request before we start, uh, your feedback is very important to us and we hope that you'll take a moment to complete a brief satisfaction survey at the end of the webcast. And now on with our program. Uh, we have three terrific presenters for you today. James Smith is Director of Global c Metrology for Census, focusing on pressure monitoring, non-revenue water, and customer service applications to solve real-world issues for utility customers. Adrian Suter is the Water Division Supervisor for the City of Walla Walla. He is responsible for the city's water distribution system, metering, and multiple regulatory programs. And Joe French is the AMI Administrator for the City of Walla Walla, and he's been with the city for eight years. So now without further ado, I will turn the program over to James. Take it away. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, appreciate your time here today. Um, we've got a good agenda and, and you're hearing very little from me and a lot from our customer uh, out there. And I think that's the way it should be. So as I go on the next slide, the agenda is we're gonna cover a brief uh, view of the wall of water utility and some of their challenges. We're gonna talk about some technology disruption in the, the monitoring space and how they utilize uh, their existing AMI network and some of the changes uh, in, in technology that, that enable that. Uh, going through their journey um, as, as they started small and kind of grew through this and some results and findings. And then some creative use cases that they came up with um, beyond pressure monitoring, again, that uh, continues there. And then we're gonna wrap it all up with a little summary, um, again, uh, of, of their process and, and how they went through this and how you can also apply these same kind of uh, technologies uh, to your water systems um, to uh, increase your understanding and visibility of your system and mitigate risk and, and improve your operations. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adrian. Thank you, James. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you're at in our great country. Let's see. It's not advancing. There we go. There you go. So I'm just going to give a brief overview here of our system so you know what uh, we're dealing with when we start getting into our solutions and applications that we deal with. We do have a fully redundant sources here in Walla Walla, complete surface water and uh, redundant groundwater wells. We do uh, ASR, aquifer storage and recovery at two of those wells. We are a little unique with our watershed. It is uh, 36 square miles of federally protected watershed so no one's allowed in it. We have a treatment plant at the end, UV disinfection, chlorine, <clears throat> nothing too exciting there. Our water distribution system uh, established in 1862. We are one of the oldest cities in Washington. Uh, they didn't do us any favors. A lot of steel main line was installed not wrapped or anything, just direct buried. So we do have a lot of corrosion issues. We're dealing with aging infrastructure like everyone else probably on this webinar is. Um, we have interconnects with other cities, um, some for emergency use only, pretty much. We don't sell a lot of water. Uh, four pressure zones. We have about 300 foot of elevation drop across the city running uh, northeast to southwest. So it's a pretty nice setup. I uh, couldn't really draw it up any better. Just nice gradual drop across the city. Uh, 29 PRV stations. 
And really what we're facing is all of the steel main is corroding and we're losing a ton of water. So trying to mitigate that, and we've done quite a bit over the last couple of years. Uh, as far as our non-revenue water, back in 2014, we had actually reduced it from 33% down to 294 and happy to announce as 2020 ended, we were at 17.4. So um, we've dropped our non-revenue water quite significantly over the last about nine years. We do a lot of acoustic leak detection. Uh, we have big challenges with the steel pipe. It definitely radiates uh, the noise through it a, a lot. So we've had to look at all different kinds of methods and solutions, and that's where we get into metering and uh, our pressure management, trying to reduce this non-revenue water. That's really what we're after here. Uh, we have multiple uh, replacement programs to replace our system, but trying to do 90 miles of steel pipe, as you know, budgets are tight. So I'm going to turn it over to Joe French, and he's going to go over some of the solutions we've used, hardware and applications. As far as our metering solutions, uh, we completed our advanced metering infrastructure deployment in 2018. Uh, with the system, we can collect over-the-air readings at an hourly resolution, uh, whereas before it was monthly, we would get a read. We use iPearl uh, residential meters and Omni commercial industrial meters, and uh, those ensure accurate readings. We've seen apparent losses from under-registration decrease uh, with our meter replacements. We've been able to eliminate some winter month read estimates that were previously necessary because the meters were inaccessible under the snow. We've been able to detect customer leaks and help conserve water. Our leak leak credit, our leak forgiveness credits have decreased uh, 75%. And we've reduced our carbon footprint by decreasing the truck rolls associated with meter reads. We don't have trucks out there on the road running around. Uh, before it was it was weekly that we were collecting reads. Now it's just a push of a button for us. Yeah, you know, the leak detection has been uh, quite impressive for us uh, with the new uh, meters. We're, we can see every dripping faucet, every toilet bowl leaking, and so we've we've had some internal challenges of how you track them down. But uh, it's we can see where every drop of water is going past that meter. So it all starts with a solid foundation. Uh, that's what the uh, Census FlexNet has given us, is a solid foundation to start with. Uh, we have two M400 base stations that collect reads for over 11,000 meters. Uh, the system is very reliable and robust, and, um, and that's really what's important before you start with some of these other applications beyond metering. Uh, we have a reliable system established, we asked ourselves, what could we use this for besides metering? Um, I'd really like to stress the, the importance of having a reliable system to start with before you move on past metering. I think at this point, I'd like to pass the presentation on to James. It sounds like uh, James is having some technical difficulties there. So, um, oh, sorry, I'm I'm chatting right away, and I'm on mute. So I apologize, guys. <laughs> uh, 
So uh, case for distributed monitoring uh, really starts with pressure monitoring. And um, as we look right here, the speed and quality repairs and the pipeline assessment and management uh, come from having the visibility to see what's going on in your system, having that knowledge so that you can be proactive in your repairs and um, get ahead of problems before they become bigger. The next part of that is pressure management and active leakage control. And there's a slide later on that goes over some well-documented studies that have shown that as you reduce the pressure in the system, a small leak or any size leak will leak less water. So being the cost of digging up and the disruption to your system of, of maintaining that, one of the cornerstones of, of leakage control is actually pressure monitoring. And when you're looking at this for the strip pressure monitoring in the surface here, all of it starts with that pressure stabilization and pressure reduction, whether it's a background leakage that just inherits the system whether it's an unreported leak that's cracked in there or whether it's something that you know has made it up the surface and you see it in the system, the, the lowest cost and, and, and first step to all of this is reducing the pressure and um, stabilizing your pressure. And when you look at your system, people, we've talked to a lot of different water utilities and, and Walla Walla is, is, is no exception there, is that the first thing they said when we talked about, you know, pressure reduction, it's right up there at the front, but they're like, you know, we can't. We don't have the confidence in knowing what's really happening in our system. We have certain levels to maintain. So a lot of times there's kind of a stagnation where you take no action because you don't have the data or the confidence and the knowledge of what the system's really operating uh, and, and, and the way pressure really operates in the system to be able to have that confidence to act. And so what, what we've seen is that this data is very, very helpful in giving you the confidence and the visibility in your system. And, and it doesn't have to be huge data. And, and what we've seen to change, and really what centers around this, is, is kind of what's changed in this pressure monitoring world. So on the left side there, you see one of our um, utilities where they had a SCADA control panel and um, uh, had pressure monitoring that was put inside that space. They were getting this data back via cellular backhaul um, going through an antenna. Sometimes people were on power or on Ethernet. Um, and you're getting, you know, hundreds of reads per second, so you have real-time connectivity, but that's kind of costly, very costly. And, and the fit, form, and function of putting that in a pit or throughout your system is really prohibitive. And so what we're seeing is this new generation of water meters and smart gateways that work on FlexNet and any other kind of RF network backhauls um, that enable the user to distribute these sensors out in their system where they were never able to distribute it before and at a price point that is, you know, 10% um, uh, of the cost of, of, of your typical installation. Now, you don't get everything with that. You don't get hundreds of reads per second, but this low resolution data, as you'll see in the coming slides, is uh, very powerful data. And, and, and this is a good example of that. So what we have here is we have two uh, Xylem products. One is the Ally meter that has an onboard pressure sensor, and the other is the Vicente, uh, Xylem Vicente product, which is a transient monitor. And, and what's nice about this is you can really see that uh, with that hundreds of time per second data versus the ally giving you hourly data, you know, it maps it really, really well. It does a good job of showing you the ups and downs, the diurnal patterns and shifts. And if you have an asset, like have a break or something malfunctioning, um, you're going to see the result of that. You're not going to catch everything, but again, it's not designed to catch everything. So what we like to say is, you know, you get 80% of the value at 10% of the cost, and it, and it enables you to extend your system visibility um, where, where you uh, really didn't have the, the hardware um, to do that or the um, infrastructure to, to get the data back. All these are battery-powered devices that we're using. So, again, there's a lot of power in that low-resolution data that gives you, you know, just good enough um, uh, information. And so with that, we're going to start to get in their journey and how they use this low pressure, uh, this, um, uh, how they deploy these sensors, and then how they use the uh, low pressure, the low resolution pressure data to get these savings and these findings. So I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Joe and Adrian. Thank you, James. So uh, we kind of have a strategic plan here how to place our sensors out, and there is definitely some different theories, and I've talked to some of my colleagues within the utility, and 
I've, I'm hearing people, you know, completely want sensors on every single residential. And where we really started at the very beginning of this was what do we need to get out of it? And we weren't sure what we were going to get, really the discovery stage. So we started fairly small with about 80 sensors in our system. We looked at elevation, hydraulic spacing, uh, distribution of them per pressure zone and getting them spaced out. We also looked at a kind of a dual purpose. With the ally meters, you get another benefit of remote shutoff. So we wanted to hit our top delinquent flyers that we don't want to send personnel to anymore to those houses to do shutoffs or we're just shutting them off, you know, every single month. So we wanted to capture those probably top 20 in our system that gave us another benefit getting this uh, strategic location. So you can kind of see the spacing there. That's how we started with our original 80. And then we knew we wanted to get all of our PRVs done also. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Joe French and he's gonna talk a little more in depth on how we set our sensors up. Thanks, Adrian. So beyond installing uh, residential water meters that have a built-in pressure sensor, we also installed some pressure transducers at our PRV locations. Uh, we installed a transducer or a sensor upstream and downstream of the PRV uh, just to monitor function of that, that unit to make sure we were dropping the pressures uh, appropriately. Installation is pretty straightforward. We used existing um, pressure gauge taps and uh, installed the transducer right into those taps. Uh, it only took several minutes to do this. Now here we have a couple of pictures of uh, one being the Ally residential meter, uh, just as simple as changing the old meter for the new one. And uh, we also installed the same pressure sensor that we did in the PRV vaults into the test port of a uh, commercial industrial sized Omni meter. Again, very uh, very simple. Uh, there's no need to add additional pressure monitoring sites. We can use existing locations that we already have throughout the city. Yeah, if I could chime in, it was just uh, such a simple installation. Uh, the hardware was there, the sites were there. So getting it set up really was, it took longer than deploying. And it, it was just a really slick, affordable, system on that end, and you just get this mountain of information back from it. So it's, it's pretty, it's very rewarding project. Okay, so looking at some of the data versus battery life, of, uh, this is mainly with our smart gateway. Um, so the meter sample rate kind of determines how long that battery life of that unit is going to last. It's shown in the table below. Um, <clears throat> the same uh, same sort of thing with uh, with an ally meter. Our ally meters read pressure data at hourly resolution. Uh, with the smart gateway, we're able to uh, lower that meter sample rate uh, anywhere from 12 second samples to 24 hours, uh, and it's programmable over the air. So it can be changed uh, if you need more data for just for a short amount of time, you can increase that sample rate and collect some data, say for a week or two, and then change it back to kind of preserve some of your battery life. But, um, it's it's really a minimal infrastructure investment to monitor your entire distribution system. Um, we are considering strictly placing two pressure sensors in each zone and just having them run at a 12 second sample rate, uh, trying to capture additional data that we might not see with the other um, just to kind of see what we're what we're dealing with. And what we've seen with the issues in our distribution system with the hourly resolution is you still pretty much see everything that something is going on. So at that stage, that's you're going to do some further investigation and dig into it. But it gives you the confidence of getting a report every single morning that your PRVs are working, your distribution system's fine and you can go about your day really fast. So it's it's a it's a great 
<clears throat> setup of how the data comes in and how the report lets you know on essentially my level or a manager's level that everything is working in your system. So we're going to move on to kind of our results and findings of what we've gotten out of this. And uh, we don't have everything in here. There is a lot more uh, issues we found within our system. So I'm happy to share in the future or if anybody else has additional questions. But uh, here's some of the key ones we've done over a little bit. One is uh, the pressure management. This goes back to the non-revenue water. How do we reduce it? How do we stop our main lines from popping so many leaks? Uh, right now, we're, in past years, we fixed up to about 180 leaks per year on 191 miles of main line. So a uh, pretty significant leak rate for us. Pressure management, definitely a surefire way to reduce real losses by reducing the background leakage. So we're looking at uh, reducing our pressures through the winter. We have to keep our pressures up for irrigation in the summer. The next step we're looking at is controlling PRVs so we can reduce pressure during the day and increase it actually at night for the irrigation systems. So hopefully, 12 hours out of every day, we can reduce that leakage rate down a bit. We're at the beginning stages of that, and we don't have great results, but our water loss shows what we have done with stabilization. Our leak rate repair has dropped off significantly in the last two years. So I contribute quite a bit to that, to getting our system stabilized. We didn't see a lot of large water hammers, but we see a lot of kind of yo-yo effect in our distribution system. So just stabilizing, I think, has helped massively on the main break side. So taking a look at uh, one of the first examples of the situation that we found after deployment of these pressure sensors, uh, we had a, an area in town that was the only area that um, underperformed our hydraulic model. And uh, we had repeated customer complaints of low pressure in the mornings. Um, we were able to take a look at the data coming in from the sensors and confirm that, yes, we were seeing a quite a pressure drop in the morning. Um, what we were able to do to mitigate the issue was, uh, first of all, to speak to a lot of the customers in that area. Uh, they had quite a few of their uh, irrigation clocks set at the exact same time, as what, and it turned out that their timing was the same as another large customer that watered many acres at the cemetery. Uh, so it was just quite a, quite a demand at the same time. Um, and we were also able to check out another um, pressure sustaining valve nearby and make some minor adjustments to that to prevent pressures from dropping below 45 PSI in this area. So b before we jump on to the next slide, can you go back? Can, can... Um, a, a, a question would be is, is, is how would you have managed this before? How, how, would, how would you have responded to those complaints before you had this data? Yeah, the, the issue all distribution systems have is we get the phone call. I have low pressure. Um, typically, as everybody knows, it's usually a volume issue and it's not a pressure issue. But in this case, this is a pressure issue. So in the past, you'd roll that truck out there. You'd say, yeah, it is low pressure. And the problem is, is you cannot see the impact area. And that's what we've seen on so many of our issues that we found that we didn't even we had issues with is how big is this issue? Where is it? And how are we going to deal with it? Because if you don't have that information, we can't reach out. We wouldn't have never known that the cemetery was causing this pressure drop way up in our system. It's quite a distance away from it. So uh, you just got to be armed with that. In the past, I, I don't think you would have really fixed it. Probably made some adjustments to PRVs, cranked them up a bit until the complaint stopped. So, And you really don't know what's going on. That's always been the issue in the past. Okay. Thanks. Another another example is something that we weren't aware of that we were able to find with uh, this new system uh, was 
uh, valve closures or openings. Uh, we had a maintenance crew doing some valve exercising, and they had mistakenly left a 20-inch valve open uh, that should normally be closed. Uh, we saw quite a pressure spike after that, but we were able to quickly identify where the issue was because we knew where we had been, and it showed the data showed that there was higher pressure in that area. We were able to match the two together and go out and get that valve closed. Just, uh, just a very quick way to to see some of these problems. Um, in most cases, uh, we're able to identify them before we get a customer complaint. And on this slide, you can see it's over multiple days. Uh, that was really, we didn't know what we were kind of looking for back then. Now, you can take this group of sensors that you see on this graph add parameters, alarms to that, and you could get, send yourself a text message as soon as that parameter or uh, pressure went outside of the parameter, low or high. So really now with valve exercising, if we're in say pressure zone two, Joe can watch that, we can get a text message within the hour of the parameter being met and we would have a, the response time would be much sooner than what you're actually seeing on this chart. So with pressure management, as I'm sure almost everybody on this webinar deals with, it's not something you just do. It's not just you send any of your crew out there. You have to be very careful with maintaining pressure, setting your PRVs, uh, making sure you have adequate supply for fire flows. It's very, can be delicate depending on your system. We have a fairly simple system in a past lifetime. I worked at the utility is very complex pressure management um, system. So everybody's a little bit different, but it definitely gives you the power to have high confidence in what your system's doing, what your PRVs are doing. If they failed, you'll see in an upcoming slide how fast you can find a failed PRV now. And knowing that it's doing what your system should be doing. So that's a lot of what it does. There's also a lot of controls. Um, we're looking into the future going forward we're looking at uh, exploring the FlexNet system, triggering valves, changing the PRV set points remotely versus rolling a truck out there. Uh, that's right here on the edge of technology. So uh, I know Clay Valve does it a lot. You can do it in well houses where you have power and you have a PLC, but the investment on those is significant. Um, I don't know anybody that has a PLC in every single PRV vault. It would cost an absolute fortune. So kind of the route we're headed is very affordable and be able to not only monitor your system, but start to control some parts of your system too. So for other use cases. Uh, you, you skipped a slide. Did I skip one? Yeah, you skipped the, the really cool one. Uh-oh. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> well, this, uh, this slide kind of um, isn't a good example of what Adrian was just talking about, being able to um, see those, um, see what's going on in your system and have good confidence in the data. Uh, we just wanted to share the slide and kind of wrap up and summarize some of the issues and improvements that we've made, uh, pressure monitoring. Uh, what we're looking at is the PRV set points over a couple of PRVs were fighting uh, each other, the larger and the smaller PRVs uh, resulted in large pressure swings and kind of a slamming uh, when the changes in PRVs happened. Um, but this causes a lot of wear and tear on our assets. Um, there's an eventual fail in a PRV in the closed position uh, is likely from the uh, that wear and tear. So um, after we saw this issue, what was going on, and <clears throat> made some repairs and reset our set points and made adjustments, 
Uh, we placed it in kind of the, the set points that we wanted for winter levels, and it really just leveled out the pressures, would stabilize it quite a bit. Yeah, some key points where Joe's hitting upon. Uh, it's not common to see a PRV fail like this, but it does happen. It was quite interesting that we had just got this on there when this situation happened, but this was a call out to our on-call staff, and that night we actually had it fixed prior to the morning rush. So I don't think we even received one complaint on this, and they never knew it even happened. It was response time was so fast and you can see the stabilization there trying to set two three four some of our pressure zones have seven prvs going into them and trying to get those all to match up is really where we're headed now it's getting that very fine-tuned system where the pressure just stabilizes out now this one you're looking at is fairly small but that's what we're moving on to in the rest of the system is getting the pressure stabilized, stopping that more or less that yo-yo effect. Yeah, and I think what I'm really excited to see coming down the road from you guys is as we get years and years of this data behind you, is being able to correlate and see like things like main breaks, pipeware, asset life, and just, you know, how much longer does that pipe last when it sees this kind of pressure and still maintains all of your deliverables Versus, like you said, that, that daily big cyclical loading up and down 30, 40 PSI every day. Um, I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see those long-term results. Yeah, and we have seen uh, one of our main transmission lines have a pretty significant break. Joe actually said something's going on before the water surfaced. Uh, in Walla Walla, we're sitting on alluvial gravels, and it can eat up just a ton of water before they, the leaks come up. So we, we okay. do have a good example of that, and that's where Joe and I kind of get excited that in the future we're going to, you're going to start learning how this works, what, what you're seeing and what does it mean. Uh, Joe saw it at that stage. We didn't know exactly what was going on, and then pretty soon, hey, we had this big break going on, and that's what it was. So pretty interesting. We've also found a reservoir we are filling too fast. Not a major issue, but it was impacting all of pressure zone one and two, dropping at about 10 to 15 PSI. So making a minor adjustment on how that reservoir gets filled, we can re eliminate or reduce that uh, pressure loss across about a third of our system, really. And I would have had no idea that that big of an area was impacted clear on one end of town. So it's it's really interesting what it shows you right and, and, and all the data that we're seeing here this is mostly hourly data yeah this, not all of it this, it's all hourly data yeah the majority of this is hourly there is a, a bit of it that's on 15 minute within the prvs but um these this graph here is all hourly okay so really once you get um on to, you know, we, we get these AMI systems, we get all this great meter reading information, all these benefits from it, um, the leak notification to customers, and then you get into pressure and being able to see what your system's doing and being able to control it and monitor it and have faith that nothing's broken, everything's working right. We started pushing the envelope even further and we're, wondering what else can we do? So right through the middle of Walla Walla is Mill Creek. It is prone to flooding. We have had a major flood in uh, 2020 and we are actually able to capture some of this data. So what we wanted to do was look at um, more or less an early warning for the floodwaters coming up. A lot of it was hey, we know, you know, the spring runoff is coming. We don't know when it's going to hit. The water is coming up. Is it 2 in the morning? Or when is it going to be that we need to dispatch crews? So we really, uh, I wanted to monitor the Mill Creek level coming into town on our first bridge. And Joe's going to go over a couple slides of how we did that. 
So the uh, the solution was pretty simple. Uh, we wanted to monitor their level, uh, so we we acquired a couple MJK uh, level sensors. Uh, the reason for having two sensors, we placed one upstream of the bridge and one downstream to see if there was a differential level uh, between uh, each side of the bridge to determine if there was a blockage or not. And we paired those sensors with a smart gateway to send those readings out to the regional network interface. Uh, we uh, we fabricated some stainless steel housings in-house, and uh, it kind of protected those sensors from debris that would float down. Uh, we've seen uh, quite a bit of large logs and that sort of thing that could potentially damage sensors, but uh, these, these housings really um, worked pretty well to protect them. I have a couple of pictures here of uh, installation upstream and downstream of the bridge and the smart gateway mounted to the bridge railing itself. It was, uh, it was a fairly simple installation. It only took several hours to deploy all of this and to start receiving some data. Uh, so what Adrian was talking about before with alerts and notifications, not only do we or can we receive alerts on pressure, but we can also set them for other sensors. So. In this case, it was a level. Um, we set, we can set alerts for high thresholds. Uh, when the water reaches a certain level, they can send an email or a text message to us to let the crews know. Uh, the way it kind of it looks on our end, seeing the, we can see the trend of the data, similar to water consumption or water pressure, but in this case, it was level. And uh, the bottom tables are some custom reports that census made for us here to uh, kind of see what our thresholds are and what what the uh, sensors are reading at each interval. So with uh, right, it was it was good timing for us. Right after we had installed these uh, sensors on the bridge, we actually had a large rainfall event. Um, the last one we'd seen to this magnitude was in 1996. So it was, it was great timing for us and it, uh, it proved the system had worked. We received text messages and emails that uh, level thresholds had been met. We had crews out there to monitor our infrastructure and um, make sure that none of those levees or bridges have been breached. Thank you, Joe. We're, we only got a couple minutes left here, and I want to leave a couple minutes here for James to wrap up. This is just some other applications to give you guys some ideas on where we're headed. So really where where I started with this AMI deployment is it, this is not a cheap investment getting the AMI system set up. So we want to leverage this to its maximum abilities. Looking at pressure monitoring, remote shot offs, we talked about. You saw some of our slides on the level monitoring. That also can be done for, you know, any pond, lake. We have them in now a reservoir. You could put them in stormwater if that's a large issue for your uh, city. You could always use continuity sensors too for stormwater. We're looking at that. We're looking at district metering, getting that put in. Um, effluent temperature we do right now for our discharge of our wastewater treatment plant. I have dissolved oxygen. I have pH sensors in industrial plants discharge. So really the whatever issues you have, if you need to monitor it through a sensor switch, something like that, uh, it's really opening up how and what we can do remotely. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to James, and we're going to sign off. Thanks, Agent. Thanks, guys. In, in some summary, I, I think that the guys have laid it out. It, it's just a journey, and we see that journey kind of broken up in, into three stages there. The discovery stage, you know, I, I don't know what I don't know, learning about the systems, you know. And, and a great way to start there once you get this data is um, to, to pair it with other data. So like your break histories, um, anything else in your um, uh, maintenance history uh, or your asset maintenance history, um, your asset history, being able to look at that and, and, and really discovering what's going on in your system. And, and I think that, that that's what we hear, number one, when everyone turns this on, 
is that, well, I didn't know that was happening. I didn't know it was this big of an issue. I didn't know that affected this. And, and hydraulic models are great, and, but, but they just don't show that cause and effect in what happens on a daily basis um, for inside the system. And then once they have that knowledge, then they go into some kind of optimizations. And a lot of times it's small. It's, it's asset performance. It's things that are set um, incorrectly. It's just understanding that when I send my crews out, I'm looking at um, uh, the pressure before I go out and after and making sure that the effect that I thought I was going to have on my system um, is having that. And it's starting to see and just to see that effect and then make those changes. And, and then also monitoring that optimization in those metrics. And so I think that getting the metrics and tracking that to start with, like those breaks per mile, not revenue water losses, um, average uh, pressure zone trends, things like that, standard deviation of pressure. You know, average pressure is nothing. If you're going up and down 30, 40 PSI a day every day, just stopping that yo-yo is going to take cyclical loading off your assets. So, so start with some of those items and um, – is there. And then lastly is the, is the monitoring. So once you feel comfortable and get optimized, then you can go into the monitoring. And there's a lot of tools out there to, to help you do that so you can keep your, um, you know, keep your eye on the system and, and have the system work for you when, when you're not sitting in front of the screen. So with that, let's go run into some questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, so yes, at this time, we'll move into the question and answer portion of the program. Um, and just a quick reminder, if you uh, still would like to ask a question, you can submit it during uh, using the ask a question box in your presentation window. Um, and so we've got a quite a few questions here. We'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, but any unanswered questions will be forwarded to the presenters to answer offline. So um, by all means, if you still have questions, please continue to submit them. So. Uh, the first question that I have here is, uh, what do you feel is the greatest value to a utility in monitoring pressure across the distribution system? This is Adrian. Um, the greatest benefit for me is probably making sure my PRVs are doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're not broken. They're not out of adjustment. Uh, the, in the past, you're always rolling a truck. A lot of utilities quarterly per year, you know, go out and look at their PRVs. You kind of look at them and say, I hope it's working, and you move on. So knowing every single morning that my system, my pressure management is doing what it's supposed to be doing is key. So, so, so in other words, the system, the visibility of your system, that you can see what's going on. Yes, it's it's never been possible in a distribution system to see what we're seeing right now. Um, you would have to deploy, you'd have to invest millions of dollars, even in a medium-sized system like ours, to have this in the past. So. It's just, it makes your pressure management 100% um, transparent what is happening, what's going on in the system. All right. Uh, the next question is, can you explain how to decide, how you decided which sites to monitor pressure? Yeah, that was, um, let me go back. If I can here, and do 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 do. So we looked at elevation, and that is you know going up and down with the pressure zones. We want it spaced out. Want to put hydraulically spacing. We want X amount of sensors in our pressure zones. They're kind of running at an angle, and you can't really see them on this map, but we wanted to make sure we're not have a big space in a pressure zone that's not being monitored. Even distribution throughout those then, and then we looked at network strength too to make sure, can we read this sensor? And that's where Joe was really hitting upon in the beginning of our presentation that it is critical that you maintain your AMI FlexNet system. It is daily maintenance, making sure it is working the way it should. That's how you can do these other applications, is having a very robust system. 
but it's really up to the utility. Um, census is providing you with everything you need, but it's the utility's job to maintain that. And then um, we also looked at the remote shutoffs. We wanted to hit the delinquents in town. Now this isn't by far complete. We started off with about 80. We've added another 40 on the PRVs. This year we're gonna add probably another 50 to start filling in gaps. And we're just trying to build up to see where that return of investment is good for us. I think that's gonna be different for every utility, but. I think you could probably go too far and get too many sensors, but we also do uh, remote ones. So when we see an issue in an area, then we'll deploy a crew out if we have to. But right now, we I don't believe we've rolled a truck yet for um, customer calling in and wondering what their pressure is or a lot of the questions you could get or complaints is low pressure and it is not. So our customer service reps are pulling this information up, addressing them on the phone, and done. So it's really sped up the process with customers getting that information to them. Okay. Um, let's see. How are you managing this increased uh, data? What increased man hours have come in interpreting and acting on uh, the data, and did you reshift scope for existing staff, or did you have to hire additional staff? Uh, we have not. Uh, Joe French is monitoring the entire system. So on a daily level, it's not that difficult. The reports you can send out to whoever you want, our utility engineer, he gets a report every morning on pressure. I get the same report on pressure. So we've incorporated into J Joe's job. Now, Joe is We've transitioned kind of all over the place to get him where he's at, but he is in charge of our AMI system, which I consider this part of it. So for our size utility, it hasn't been that big of an issue monitoring it. What we have found is more issues that we need to actually go deal with. So dispatching crews out to get things fixed is probably where we spent more time. Yeah, and, and something that we didn't dig into super deep here was the software that supports this. So some of those graphs and charts you see are from what's called the pressure profile software. And, and, and it does a good job of spatially showing you what's going on in the system and helping you digest that data. So don't think that these guys are, are pouring over spreadsheets and outputs and, and lookup tables and things like that. The, the software that supports this is graphically based um, and shows you the, the pressure in the system and the charts um, in, in a very user-friendly way. I think that helps with managing it. Would you agree, guys? Yeah, definitely. And getting your parameters set up and spending time on the initial, you know, integration of it. So if something does go out of bracket or out of the parameters that you're going to get alarmed out, it is very user-friendly set up for operating your system. It is not time-consuming to monitor your entire distribution system for pressure. It is set up very well. All right. Uh, can you provide a couple examples of leaks that you've been able to detect or resolve with the system and how have customers uh, responded? Um, I'm not 100% sure how to answer that. On the customer side, we see it through the AMI metering. So any leakage, we have custom reports built, and they get sent every morning on the customer side. So that gets addressed one way. And through the pressure um, profile, we did see that, I spoke of it earlier, the large transmission break. I am. That's going to be key after I think Joe monitors the pressure profile for a couple of years. He's going to become very familiar with what is our system doing and when it goes or starts to head kind of out of whack a little bit that you're going to start seeing what's going on and have a better idea of what you're looking for. But right now we could tell something was wrong. We just didn't know where to look. But that was at the very beginning of us getting it.
Okay. Uh, have you incorporated this system uh, in an asset management program and capital improvement program? Yeah, no, not at this point. We are um, kind of another interesting case study is with the AMI system, we're incorporating all of that real-time consumption data into our hydraulic model. So the hydraulic model is updated with real data, real consumption, and not uh, projections. So that's kind of an exciting thing that's coming. We're going to get to see from Bentley that it how, what our model looks like afterwards, and it should be extremely accurate. It's been good, but it should be right down to doing some major um, large subdivisions going in and being able to project what the consumption is and the rates, what our velocities are going to be through our mains and such, but not so much on the capital side yet. All right. Uh, for helping to detect large trans transmission leaks, excuse me, uh, how real time is the data? Um, this person says they were under the impression that the hourly data is transmitted four to six times a day, uh, not actually real time unless it's an alarm. Yeah, um, I, I wish we had the graph here that showed uh, we we have where the break happened and what we saw with the hourly resolution. And it happened the day before, and that's where Joe started looking to say, hey, something's going on here. And then by the next morning, it had surfaced. So it's it probably came in, you are correct in the hourly coming in, what is it, Joe, every four? Mm -hmm. Every four hours. So you're gonna get four data points in the first four hours of that leak. and. We saw it, we just weren't sure what we're, what to do with it at that stage or where what was going on, but it was big enough that it blew the road up the very, very next morning. So it, there would be some, I can kind of see it, I think more transitioning. We have a lot of smaller leaks. I think that's possibly what we're gonna see in uh, change over time versus something very sudden like that. That's where we also looked at putting in a couple very strategically placed sensors that are running on the smart gateways. We can run them down to every 12 seconds. So I think we could capture leaks better that way. We have not deployed those yet, but that's kind of on our do list. Yeah, and, and, and let me jump in there too. So, so you were right when you said about the alarms. So if, if the Smart Gateway or the Ally detects an alarm. So they're measuring every hour. So say you have a one hour MSR measurement interval that's broadcasting every four. If it detects an alarm, it will send a broadcast out at that measurement interval. So if you're on hour two and you get an alarm during that hour and it goes for the reading and it sees that there was an alarm message, from zero to 59 minutes of when that occurred, it's going to send that up and say, hey, here's an alarm on the system and that will give you the text notification um, and that. And for the smart gateways, the same thing, whether it's set on five minutes or 15 minutes. So we see people like, like uh, Walla dithering those higher resolution um, sensors out there. You can also, not just a smart gateway, but the ally meter, you have to buy a radio that is unlocked that allows you to go below one hour MSRs, um, but you can dial the smart, the ally down to, I think, five minutes. Um, so, so you do have some options there to, again, you're burning up more battery. You're talking, you know, three-year life or four-year life versus a 20-year life. Um, but you, you do have the ability to, um, uh, to, to, to ratchet up that MSR. And if there is an alarm, then you're going to hear about it between, you know, zero and whatever your MSR setting is, be it five minutes, 15 minutes, or an hour. But that goes back to what Adrian was saying when he said he set the alarms and set the thresholds in the system. If you're just looking at the server side data, you're not going to see that. But if you're actively managing it the way Walla is, and they set though they they understood their system and they set the threshold to say, hey, if it's below this, we want to know about it. Then that's when you would see those alarms. Okay. Uh, is there a benefit to the community for creek level monitoring on the part of the utility? 
uh, maybe public safety, for instance. Yes, definitely. That's um, that's exactly the point. Is knowing when when to get crews dispatched versus them showing up in the morning and then going and checking, and then we have the oh we are have a problem. You know, we're there much sooner. And kind of uh, in the past, I've been through a couple flood events. You know, you, you have people coming in late. You have somebody standing out there with a radio trying to talk to your director or your um emergency manager and reporting data in that way versus my director's coming down and we're printing off a graph this is exactly what the creek is doing coming into town so he knows that visual representation is so much power in that you can see that it's not maybe you know a screaming emergency right now that it is coming up slowly or hey we just had a huge spike an hour ago and we also have parameters set there of the depth of the channel we know when it's going to breach out of that channel so getting that alarm and you could set it for whatever you know distance you want your your comfort level but for us it was i think we're about six feet before breaching out we want that first alarm to hit us to say hey the water's come up significantly and you know you have a couple hours before this is going to leave the channel and you need to start your response so the biggest thing of it is response time cutting it down knowing what is going on data is king okay uh, has the pressure data been fed into hydraulic modeling software to better tune the accuracy of the model Yes, we are in process right now with uh, Bentley, and it is, uh, as far as I know, the first time it's ever been done. Well, we are putting real-time consumption into the hydraulic model. So, um, you know, my my hope here, and uh, Bentley's been great to work with, uh, with Census getting this done. But I think our model is going to be one of the best that's out there as far as accuracy it should be really impressive all right uh, if you're looking to monitor pressure in your distribution system are there recommended places to start adding monitoring solutions Yeah, it's it, that's really going to bend around the utility and what you can afford and how big a utility you are and how complex your, you know, pressure system is. So everybody's going to be a little different, but I could not emphasize enough getting the upstream and downstream of your PRVs uh, sensors on those. It's going to give you pressures within your system. It's also going to tell you whether your PRVs are, you know, failed or if they are working properly. So I would probably start there unless your utility really has a chronic area of pressure issues that you've never been able to figure out, never had enough information, you know, to be able to make decisions or send you in the right path. So I, w I would say PRVs and then any major chronic areas that you've had in the past that you know of. Yeah, and, and we haven't talked about price during during any of these, but I mean the the ally meter, uh, depending on where you're buying it from, the distributor, you know, just just call it less than 500 bucks to install the smart gateway with the pressure sensor uh, kits attached to them. You're probably talking a thousand dollars, and then the pressure profile software being used is, you know, um, depending on how many sensors you have, um, uh, it, it's, it's in the low thousand dollars, the thousands of dollars range inside of there. So I mean. If you deployed 50 sensors, um, a mix of allies and smart gateways, plus the software, I mean, you, you, you're probably looking somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, anywhere from 20 something up to maybe at the high end, 50 something grand. Um, we, we got a water utility who's deploying 100 something sensors and having contractors doing it, and they're monitoring their whole system for less than $100,000 um, all in full setup. And, and so I, I think that when you're talking about those kind of numbers and even to pilot the program, you're talking about you know, you you can be out there for five to ten grand and do proof of concepts uh, th th that can show you real results. It, it's those kind of simple, easy uh, things that is why we're seeing this be so popular. 
You know, it doesn't take a $10,000 SCADA panel, you know, dropped in with power backhaul and Ethernet to do this. This is an, an easy change out to, to get this benefit. And even to add a little more to that, James, I mean, the Ally is a full iPro meter inside, too. So you're you're getting the benefit right. of right. it's not just $500 for the pressure. You're also getting temperature and you're monitoring the consumption, you know, metering whatever house you put that on also. So there's right. there's other benefits on top of that even, too. The benefits just keep stacking and stacking for us as the more we dig into applications we could do. Your point. All right. It uh, looks like we are at the top of the hour. So um, I just want to take this moment to thank uh, today's speakers, James Smith, Adrian Suter, and Joe French on behalf of Waterworld and Endeavor Business Media, um, as well as our sponsor, Census, for today's presentation, system-wide pressure monitoring with low-resolution data. Uh, as a reminder, this presentation will be archived within 24 hours and can be accessed at waterworld.com for the next six months. A reminder email message will be sent to all registrants with a direct link to the archive. Uh, please take a moment to share your feedback with us by completing the brief, brief satisfaction survey at the end of the session. Um, and a certificate of attendance for today's webcast will be emailed to all registrants within 24 hours of today's event. With that, we thank you for joining us today and look forward to serving you with future webcasts. This concludes today's presentation. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.